Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, New Generation GNSS Solutions, Precise Positioning, Navigation, and Applications. This is brought to you by our sponsor, Hemisphere. I'm Bethany Chambers from North Coast Media, publisher of GPS World Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we begin, I'm going to go over some ways that you can participate during today's presentation. Although you are currently in a listen-only mode, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. You can also submit questions via Twitter by using the hashtag GPSWorldWebinar. Questions that were submitted during registration have already gone to our panelists and may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of GPS World Magazine or in one of our many e-newsletters. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, use the same Q&A box at the bottom left to tell us about your issue and click Submit and Assistant Producer Jackie Petrie or I will personally assist you. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon at gpsworld.com slash webinars. You can get to that page now and bookmark it by clicking on the header at the top of your screen above your slides. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, GPS World Contributing Editor, Eric Daxter. Hey, thanks a lot, Bethany, and uh, great to have you all here today. Uh, I think this is going to be a really interesting webinar. I haven't done one in a while, and this is some uh, a really interesting subject that lots of people are uh, are asking about. So, got a couple of uh, highly qualified speakers today: uh, Rodrigo Leandro from uh, Hemisphere, and then uh, Sunil uh, Bisnath, uh, a, a, a a professor from the Northeast. And I'll get into his bio here in a second. So, just as a Introduction, uh, I am contributing editor to GPS World Magazine and editor at Geospatial Solutions. I've been a consultant to government agencies and private companies in, on GPS technology for the last 25 years. Um, lots of experience in the field and, uh, and writing about this and, and covering the, the kind of subject that, uh, that our speakers today are, are talking about. So uh, Rodrigo is uh, director of engineering at Hemisphere GNSS. Uh, author of numerous scientific publications and patents. He's got a PhD in uh, spatial geodesy from the University of New Brunswick in Canada. We've also uh, very happy to have uh, Sunil Bisnath, the PhD associate professor at York University, researcher in precise GNSS positioning and navigational algorithms and applications with a doctorate in geodesy and geomatics engineering from University of New Brunswick in Canada. Uh, I think UNB is where our own uh, uh, contributing editor, uh, Richard, is from, I believe. So uh, great there. So I'm going to pass this on off to, uh, I think, to Sunil to start off uh, after the outline here. So here's the, uh, the subject we'll cover today. One is the challenges of a single receiver positioning, uh, in other words, autonomous positioning. And we'll discuss a little bit about relative positioning with different correction technologies. Uh, the correction services technology, and then uh, and specifically PPP, real-time PPP, and then uh, technology examples, which is Hemisphere's uh, new Atlas correction service, and then a little about future trends here. So um, should be a great subject. We'll get lots of questions. We've got lots of pre-webinar questions, and I'm sure we'll get some live ones, too, that we'll get to also. So I'm going to go ahead and push the next slide out and hand off to uh, Sunil. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we wanted to start uh, today's webinar off with a, a little introduction of uh, single receiver uh, positioning or point positioning. Uh, there are many of you out there who know awful lot about these things, but we do want to to speak to the entire audience. So just uh, very quickly a few slides of the, the challenges uh, related to single receiver positioning. And, uh, in this first slide, uh, ideally, um, what we have is a GNSS, a GNSS data processing model that would assume a perfect uh, line of sight measurement uh, of time or equivalently distance between the satellite and the receiving uh, antennas. Uh, however, we know that that's not the case. Um, one of the large areas that we deal with are satellite positioning errors. The satellites. Uh, broadcast 
through their their uh, messages as satellite positions, which are in error with respect to the actual satellite coordinates by one or two meters or so. Uh, we have a similar situation with the transmitted satellite uh, clock uh, correction uh, that is um, that converted from time to distance um, represents a, another one or two meter of error in the position, as you can see in the figure here, uh, projected to the user. On top of those um, satellite-specific errors, we also have transmission-related uh, errors, uh, the first being um, the transmission of the signal through the ionosphere. Uh, the ionosphere refracts the signal, um, producing uh, many tens of meters, up to many tens of meters of error, and this error is uh, frequency-dependent. If we travel down with the signal to the Earth's surface, we go through the, the neutral atmosphere, or as we tend to call it, the troposphere, um, where we see uh, another type of refraction that causes uh, meter level errors in that range as well. And in this cartoon figure, you can just see how that idealized uh, straight line uh, signal now has all these these bends and curves in it, and again, of course, it's a cartoon. Finally, um, this effect is compound, these effects, I should say, are compounded by the geometry of the many satellites that we need to track in order to produce a user position or to determine uh, our, our time. Uh, so this geometry-dependent uh, aspect, given that we're tracking many satellites. If we combine these together in a in a single figure, um, which people are typically looking for, are, is what the magnitude of the each effect is, how we mitigate them, and we can see that in the third column, whether we're modeling or filtering or not doing anything at all to them, and the resulting effect uh, after any mitigation strategy. We can see that the this table in a in another form, in, in, the, in these, these cartoons, in this figure, uh, where each block represents part of the overall uh, observation error budget. And so we have the troposphere down at the bottom on the left. Uh, in, re in blue, uh, the ionosphere in the yellow block, the orbit and clock errors in the red block, and then the code and phase measurements from our GNSS, where the code measurement uh, precision is uh, much lower than the phase measurement precision. Uh, the typical uh, single receiver positioning mode uh, has mitigation strategies for the, for the uh, atmospheric errors, and the result is what we see on the right past the equal sign, where we see this 1 to 10 meter level ranging accuracy that then is projected given the the geometry of the satellites we're tracking into uh, the quality of our user solution. So that's the situation we have in point positioning. I'll pass things over to Rodrigo, who will take us uh, very quickly through the relative positioning scenario. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to, to this webinar. So I'll start talking a little bit about uh, how the situation changes when we look at the relative positioning case. So I will start more or less with a slide that's very similar to what Sunil do, just showed to you. Uh, the first thing that's important to uh, notice here is that the effects, the fundamental effects are basically the same. If you look at the uh, user receiver, what the user receiver experiences is, is, is the same if you are operating either autonomous or single receiver mode, as we're calling it, or in relative. The difference, big difference here is what you do in order to mitigate those effects. Um, in the case of a relative, instead of uh, trying to model those effects, which is mostly what we're trying to do in autonomous, we either model them or filter the data in case of the code measurements, we place another receiver, which we typically call the reference receiver, very close by our user. And the whole idea here is that uh, as far as those two receivers are, uh, are, are close to each other enough, the effects that are, that are experienced in the signal for both the end user and by the reference are very, very similar. Uh, 
which means that uh, if we difference or if we subtract one signal to, from the other, those effects are mostly eliminated. So one of the one important thing to 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 note here is that uh, uh, one is that uh, this uh, it's a very effective way to eliminate or or mitigate most of those effects, but it is a big trade-off, which is uh, the fact that we have to have a, another receiver close by to operate, and we typically call the we, we require to have an infra infrastructure around you, and not only um, in in terms of having a receiver uh, that's positioned nearby your user, but also a communication in case you're operating in real time uh, uh, operation. So, so in, in terms of look sorry, on, in terms of near, sorry, in terms of nearby, could you expand on that a bit? I mean, you know, it could be anywhere from what can be uh, within a kilometer or out to how far, what kind of distance? So this varies a lot uh, with respect to the application. So where we, sometimes we are referring to short single base lines. You have a single receiver that might be from a few meters to a few kilometers, and this basically gives you almost a full elimination of all those effects. So we, we end up with a, a resulting observation that uh, is uh, uh, it's precise down to um, millimeters to centimeters. Uh, as you start to move away uh, from your user, then you start to experience more differences, especially as far as the troposphere and ionosphere goes, and then end up a little bit more error. So, um, and then we end up with uh, residual errors that might go in the order of a several centimeters, depends on depending on distance plus activity on the ionosphere and troposphere. So uh, one of the ways that uh, 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 one of the techniques that exist to countermeasure that is to use network of reference stations, which we typically call network RTK type of applications, and then you can mo further model the uh, atmosphere a little bit more, and then reduce again those residual effects. Um, so depending on the type of infrastructure, distance, and type of uh, uh, atmospheric conditions, then the, the residual effect can vary all the way from uh, centimeter level to several centimeters. In case of network RTK, typically uh, uh, you'll be talking about uh, several tens of kilometers distances between uh, reference stations. Uh, for when people start to talk about applications where you have long baselines up to 100 kilometers or so, that's when uh, you end up really be talking about the decimeter residual errors in certain cases. So this is a table similar to what we had before. Uh, as I said before, the, the fundamental errors are the same as in the case of the single receiver. The big difference is the third column here that we are instead of having a mitigation model or technique, we're basically simply differencing uh, uh, the, the two observations of reference and rover. And then we end up uh, with a, a few millimeters to centimeters, depending on the distance. Uh, in this case, uh, if you're talking about a centimeter level, it's a fairly short distance or a fairly uh, not too sparse network RTK system. Uh, and uh, if you use your phase measurement, then we end up with observation that's good down to uh, just a centimeter or so, which uh, gives you what we have today in terms of RTK performance. Not only gives you a very accurate phase measurement, it also gives a very good notion about the atmosphere, which helps you to uh, initialize a receiver very quickly. As we have today, a state-of-art RTK systems, they are able to reach centimeter level in just a few seconds. So this is the graphical visualization of the same table as we had before, where we have all the errors again, same for troposphere, atmosphere, orbit, and clock. And then on top of those, we have a little bit of uh, what the phase and code measurement noise adds on top of that. Um, when we subtract the reference data, uh, most of the uh, systematic effects, which are troposphere, atmosphere, and clocks, they are removed. Uh, and the code and phase measurement noise is a little bit uh, increased because uh, these are uh, stochastic type of errors and then they are added up instead of uh, being subtracted because they're not the same at reference and over. But uh, at the end of the process, we end up with uh, code measurements that are good, down, good to a few meters uh, and phase measurements that are, uh, can be modeled down to a few centimeters. And this is what we end up using for network, for RTK systems to, to have centimeter level positioning with very high accuracy, very high reliability and robustness. 
So that's basically how we end up with uh, what we call today RTK level of uh, accuracy. So if we investigate a little bit how things fit in, in terms of uh, when you compare to single receiver application that Sunil talked about with a relative, if we put them on a, share, on a chart where we have uh, the accuracy performance, where we have the relative position is the most, uh, uh, um, the highest level of performance you can get, single receiver is the lowest. And in terms of availability, single receiver is the most available because it's available anywhere on the planet, while relative you will have to rely on infrastructure or nearby infrastructure then it's the least available system that you have, uh, this is more or less they fit in that chart. Um, between, the, between them, what we, are, what we uh, uh, placed here was a compromise region where we can move uh, between the two and we can make compromises in terms of how much infrastructure you have around you uh, and how much accuracy or how much performance you are want to achieve. So just to give some light on what that uh, could look like, and we can debate where those type of systems go into, inside this chart. There's always a discussion about that, but uh, we, we, we thought, okay, yes, bass would go more or less in the middle of the two because you have uh, then a system that's available uh, for whole countries or very, very, very large regions, uh, but we have uh, still a big compromising performance when you compare them to network RTK systems. They are still sub-meter level systems. Um, and then we have network RTK. Again, fundamentally, they are very similar to uh, uh, fundamental single receiver relative positioning, um, but they still require a lot of infrastructure. Even though you can increase a little bit the area, the coverage area of those systems, it's still very small when you put this uh, in comparison to what you can achieve with a single receiver on a worldwide basis. So that's why it's so close to what we call in the relative. Uh, but yet, it's very, very close in terms of uh, to the best we can do in terms of accuracy. So on top of that, what we would like to see is, okay, where we want to be, right? Where we want to be uh, in terms of uh, GNSS uh, industry or, or, or scientific community, what we want to, wh where we want to get at, which is basically the very high uh, corner, the corner on the, on the, on the right, high, high, high right side. Um, and uh, that's kind of the holy grail of uh, GNSS performance. We're not there yet. And all the work both the industry and scientific community has been doing is trying to find ways from some direction on how to get to that point eventually. Um, today, we we're talking a lot about correction services, um, basically global correction services, uh, which is one way to try to make the single receiver case to, to, to migrate in terms of accuracy. We are, we are, we're placing this uh, error coming from the single receiver because of the global nature of correction services. These are services that are available worldwide. So they, 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 they fulfill the availability requirement in terms of being available uh, all over the planet. Now, what the correction services do, they are bringing more accuracy to that uh, availability. And that's why we are moving upwards from a single receiver. And, uh, um, and that's what we're going to be discussing a little bit more in the next slides, how this is possible, how that works, and give you some examples. I'm going to pass over back to Sunil, and you'll be talking a little bit about uh, how correction, global correction services work in general. Right. And if I can Thanks. just interject just for a minute, just so for uh, uh, for RTK networks, for example, and, and at least here in the U.S., um, probably about 35 different states have set up their own statewide RTK networks so you can access RTK from that perspective. But, again, they're all regional services, whereas when, uh, uh, when Rodrigo talked about global correction services, that means you can use it anywhere in the U.S., anywhere in North America, uh, South America, Africa, Asia. Europe and so on without uh, in, in a very consistent manner rather than having these uh, regional systems. So RTK networks are a small regional. SBAS like WAS in America is sort of a nationwide system and the global correction services are, are just what it says. It's absolutely global. Thank, thanks Eric and Rodrigo. 
So just a, a few slides on uh, generally what's meant by these by these global uh, correction services. It's, it's important to talk about them at least a little bit to understand their characteristics because the average user never actually sees or touches uh, touches the infrastructure that's involved. Uh, first of all, in this figure, we have um, uh, basically uh, sort of, uh, if we go through the chain here, at the top left, uh, it's all based on a, a global network of reference stations, uh, uh, G GPS or GNSS uh, reference stations uh, around the globe. Uh, and uh, we can always uh, go into quite a scientific debate on the number of stations that are necessary, but the global coverage is what's, what's key uh, to be able to continuously track uh, the GNSS network or, or satellites or, or constellations that we're interested in. Um, uh, with that backbone or, or that, that, that infrastructure, um, we uh, then uh, collect all of this tracking information, which is the same type of information that a user is tracking, the, the code and phase measurements and, uh, and, um, and broadcast messages from the satellites, which is all then brought together at a processing center where all the data is processed. Uh, the results of that large estimation process, uh, that large estimation process, is um, uh, satellite information, orbit and clock information, very precise orbit and clock information. If we go back to the to the uh, single receiver positioning uh, error budget, we can then really bring down the orbit and clock errors in that part of the budget. Um, um, on on top of that, we can also, that, we can also uh, estimate, uh, estimate <coughs> other, uh, other other corrections uh, such other as correction. atmospheric models, atmospheric um, models and, uh, satellite, and uh, other satellite other satellite biases. Other satellite bias. uh, this so-called satellite correction so data, uh, these are then transmitted uh, to the end user via satellite or the internet, um, depending on the, the particular uh, system. And at the end user uh, system, the user has their GNSS uh, unit with firmware that does the end user processing and also receives these uh, so-called satellite corrections or the, the correction data uh, that is then combined with very specialized algorithms, including the processing of the carrier phase measurements uh, and uh, other models to produce the the user position that uh, that that we know. Um, uh, we should also mention that within this process of of uh, making use of the carrier phase measurements, the, the the carrier phase measurements, as most of us know, um, contain an unknown component, an unknown number of of uh, carrier cycles for each satellite, uh, known as the carrier phase ambiguity. And if and given that we're we're doing this processing uh, with, through the uh, ionospheric refraction we talked about, this requires time to get the proper estimates of these carrier cycle counts for each satellite. What that means is that when these global solutions are run at the user uh, site, uh, there tends to be a, a period of uh, uh, of convergence required in the solution from when the receiver first starts operating before we reach the few centimeter uh, um, accuracy level, the so-called convergence period. And this is typically on the order of minutes or perhaps a few tens of minutes. And that's why users uh, have this convergence period. And the result has been that these systems have flourished in certain areas, such as offshore uh, farming areas, uh, large um, uh, open space areas where uh, the network, for example, network RTK infrastructure hasn't existed. Uh, the correction services have become the de facto standard in many of these applications. Uh, so with that general description, I'd like to pass things back to Rodrigo and he'll give us a very specific example and go into to, to a number of more details. Thank you, Sunil. Um, so 
I'd like to talk a little bit more now to uh, about an example we have here, which is the Atlas Correction Service. This is a correction service that Hemisphere introduced uh, uh, about a, a few weeks ago. And, uh, and the first question that you might be asking is why why should we should should Hemisphere introduce a new correction service? So, because as we know, there are already services out there. Uh, so what's the problem we are solving here by introducing a new one? Um, so first of all, we Hemisphere, as we as we just showed to you, this is one of the trends in technology moving forward. So uh, this is how we want to see GNSS technology moving forward in the future, global availability, very high accuracy, uh, very spread usage of uh, high accuracy technology else, everywhere. So uh, that's what this is part of uh, Hemisphere needs to have uh, uh, something that's part of their product line uh, as part of their product, uh, of our products. This is one side of things. Uh, the other side of things is that uh, there is still, this is a fairly new technology still. Um, there is still much ground to be covered as we're going to be discussed, discussing the future trends uh, section. And uh, also, there is still largely unattended markets uh, that are still not making use of this type of technology that, that, uh, that could be attended. And this is one of the problems we are focusing on, which is to making sure that uh, this technology is actually available to people or businesses that uh, didn't have access to that before that. Um, so we have cases where uh, sometimes OEM integrators, they either don't have an option to, to introduce this technology in their products, or they have too restrictive options to introduce that technology in their products. And that we, we what we want to do is to offer a cost-effective, business-effective option for, for those businesses and, and people. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that I would like to say is we created Atlas to be a, a, a service where we, Hemisphere is also, as you very well know, a hardware provider. But uh, we, our mentality is that we use our hardware so that we can offer this service in a wider uh, basis instead of uh, using the service so we can sell more of our hardware. So our mentality is we want to make sure that the correction services are as available as possible to people who either didn't have option before or have uh, too many restrictions to have that, uh, that, uh, that type of technology. In terms of uh, the system architecture, it is very similar to the general description Sunil just gave to you, which means that uh, we have uh, uh, infrastructure where we get a network reference station data into control centers. These control centers, they process the data, they generate uh, uh, precise information about the satellites. This information is encoded in a proprietary format that we created. And uh, this is one of, uh, also one of the key things about the Atlas service. We have designed a very state-of-art, future-looking uh, message design for this system. So we believe that we are prepared to, uh, uh, to contemplate applications for the next several tens of years uh, uh, with the message we designed. Uh, these messages then either sent over internet to our users, these are the users that connect to the system over internet, or they go through an uplink facility, transmit it to an L-band satellite, and then transmit it back to the users over L-band. These are the users that are re receiving the corrections over satellite transmission. On top of that, in our architecture, we have a customer portal, so the users can go access uh, a system uh, over the internet, make their purchases, configure the system. So we it's part of uh, the business side of things where we try to make the system as easy to use and configure and manage as possible. Can I ask a quick question, of, uh, Rodrigo? And, and, I, and I hope you can just touch this a little bit. So the difference between RTK and this type of service is, and I think an example here is, for example, Washington State has an RTK network, and they need or they use upwards of 100 reference stations just for the state of Washington. For this type of architecture, what's the density of reference stations, would you say? So typically, the systems that run this type of uh, uh, technique, they run with a global network of a bit anywhere between 100 and 200 stations distributed worldwide. And uh, after that, depending on the type of correction system you are, you are providing, then it's pretty much all you need. Um, if you 
are dealing with a further modeling of ionosphere or atmosphere in general, then start to migrate kind of a somewhere between network RTK and uh, global correction services. But uh, to, to, to reach the performances that we're looking here, basically the user doesn't, don't need to care at all about what's around him. He just needs to connect to the system, receive the corrections, and he gets the performance uh, basically everywhere, independent of the infrastructure. In terms of coverage, this is a, a very standard L-band type of coverage uh, that where we go up uh, north and south, uh, somewhere between 70 and 75 degrees. Um, when you look at uh, uh, the internet coverage, it's basically restricted only by where you can get internet connectivity, and then as long as you can connect the system over internet, then uh, you can use it. There is no uh, limitations there besides the connectivity then. So this is uh, a little bit a closer look on how the performance of the system looks like, and now we're bringing to you a practical example of what I've been talking about that where we're saying, well, you can actually reach centimeter level uh, uh, with a single receiver, uh, which is what we're showing here. And as part of uh, uh, the compromises of running a global service and uh, being available everywhere with today's technology, we have a little bit of a convergence time, which is what you can see in the lower lower left uh, plot. Uh, we have a few minutes of convergence time, but eventually get down to a sub-decimeter performance. And uh, uh, if you're running uh, uh, on a receiver that uh, it's, has reasonably good environment, then end up with uh, not more than four centimeter RMS and so on, which is very, uh, um, sufficient for a wide number of our practical applications. So uh, you can think of uh, how many applications can be served of that level of precision have, when you think that, uh, well, and yeah, I don't need to care about connectivity, or if I'm inside the network RTK system, or if I'm in an account like Brazil where I don't have access to SBAS, uh, and this kind of performance is actually available. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things we we were discussing just earlier today, is that uh, um, this is what we call the H10 service, where we offer the sub meter performance. And uh, we offer two other levels of service, and one of them is we call the H100, which is meant to be a, some sort of SBAS replacement for people who don't either don't have access to SBAS or would have to be would be interested in having an SBAS type of performance where we have not only GPS available as part of the system but also GLONASS and so on. So, um, so these are also the other levels of service we also offer as part of the system. So this is still looking at the high accuracy level uh, uh, service. As you can see, it's just a, uh, two different ways to look at how the performance looks like. Uh, on the left, we have the height performance. Uh, again, uh, given the time, it goes down to a few centimeters and so on. And on the right-hand side, we have the plot of the scatter plot of the horizontal position error, which is, again, uh, a very well uh, contained within a decimeter box. And uh, again, this is, this is very sufficient for a very number of applications. And the whole deal of the Atlas system is that uh, what we're targeting to is to talk to people and make sure that uh, they understand that uh, this technology exists and that there is a business uh, that is uh, really willing to make sure that uh, they have access to that. And that's what we are working on right now as part of this system. So, Rigo, there's a quick this question from the audience that I think is, is good to cover right now. The audience is asking, which constellations are supported by the Atlas uh, architecture? So, right now we support fully support GPS and GLONASS, and we have partial support to Beidou, uh, but we, have full, we will have full support to Beidou very soon. That's the current situation. So, um, Right now, uh, so this slide I'm showing a, a little bit of different view of uh, how you can look at the performance. This is what we call pass-to-pass. -pass. Just to give you some background, this is something that's very typical in agriculture applications. 
Uh, in agriculture, people typically are concerned about how well you can measure the distance between two tractor tracks. And that's the, those tracks are typically separated uh, by 15 minutes in time, which is what we then define as pass-to-pass, -pass, which is your uh, kind of a correlated error uh, over 15 minutes time frame. And that's what we have here, what Atlas Systems is capable of providing that type of uh, uh, positioning uh, capability. About 2.5 centimeters, one sigma, 5.7 to sigma. It's very typical performance we get. This is another example. It's a little bit more on the survey, kind of survey GIS side of things. Uh, that was uh, a test we did to verify uh, a repeatability of a position. So what we did was to use a receiver to observe a point, and that's where you can see in the uh, red box the convergence, where we are basically waiting for the system to converge on top of a point. And then we walk around under trees and so on and came back to the same point afterwards. Uh, what you can see in the yellow box is the time where we are moving around under the trees of the receiver, and then on the two green boxes are the times when we were uh, uh, observing the point before moving and they were then observing the point after movement uh, uh, coming back. And uh, you can see that's pretty consistent. And that's what uh, kind of performance we have been consistently seeing when we perform this type of uh, observations. So this is, this is uh, um, so the, the, these last slides, we've been talking about how the technology looks like and how the performance uh, can, what kind of performance can be expected and so on. But then the other big question is how you reach the user, how how the user gets access to the system, what how you reach the market. And uh, of course, Atlas is being introduced as part of a, a hemisphere line of products, but we also created a new smart antenna, which was specially created just to support the Atlas service. So we are calling this antenna, this smart antenna, the Atlas Link. It's a multi-purpose smart antenna. It has a lot of capability, including internal memory, web server, uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, connectivity, and so on and a few other very interesting features. As I said before, uh, one of the things about Atlas is that we want to make sure that the people really have access to L-band services. And the Atlas Link Antenna has one, one of the features that allows us to uh, uh, make that to happen in certain cases. Uh, that feature, one of those features we call the Smart Link. And this is one of uh, the solutions we created to uh, uh, expand the reach of L-band services to people who uh, would otherwise not have access to that. So what you see right now is the situation for a user that has a GNSS device with no L-band capability in, for whatever reason, either technical or, or cost or, or whatever reason it is that the user doesn't have access to that. What we have is, well, L-band is transmitting signal. I have a GPS receiver or a GNSS receiver. I can track my satellites, but the best I can do is create a position solution that's uh, what we may, might be calling the single receiver or SBAS solution. Uh, so how we solved that? So what we did was to uh, create a, f a capability inside Atlas Link where the user is able to uh, install that antenna on the same uh, platform or vehicle uh, where he has his existing system. And that antenna will receive the Atlas L-band signal. And then over uh, a connection, which could be a serial connection, it sends the standard data to the other device in say RTCM format, and that other device is able to produce an Atlas position. So this is a solution where people would like to have to extend their capabilities, say with L-band, but don't want to touch their installation too much. So this 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 works as an, a sort of L-band extension to existing installation. So people who have receivers that are maybe not able to track L-band, or maybe these are single frequency receivers, this also works fine. So that's, uh, and this is all, uh, uh, as I said before, this antenna has a, a Wi-Fi server, a web server with Wi-Fi capabilities. So this is all very easily configurable with a, a phone or, or any device that has Wi-Fi capabilities. 
just uh, to give an example, this is uh, example of a smart link in operation. What we did was to connect the smart link to d two different known hemisphere receivers and run the system for a few hours. And uh, you can see that uh, this is basically a typical performance that, uh, as we were showing before, uh, the typical convergence time at the beginning, as we have discussed, is uh, something that uh, to be expected in global services. Uh, and then the final performance down to just a few centimeters, as as, as we typically see. So this is a summary, uh, very short, sum, very uh, high level summary of uh, what Atlas is, which is uh, L-band, a correction service offered over either L-band or internet that can provide you with uh, position solutions at a four centimeter RMS or so, in addition to that, with a few extra capabilities to support uh, additional hardware, such as uh, smart link uh, um, and so on. So also, I'd so, like to add in there, Rodrigo, maybe you can expand on it, but so they don't, that the user doesn't uh, require the Atlas link because some manufacturers, some GNSS receiver manufacturers can embed the Atlas service within their receivers, is that correct? That's correct, that's part of our business model. So we are an OEM oriented business. So uh, whenever uh, other manufacturers need to uh, implement what we call the Atlas library, uh, this can be available in uh, other receivers as well. Um, so I'll pass back to Sunil, he'll uh, lead us uh, over the uh, future trends uh, slides, and we'll be discussing about what we expect in the future. Okay, thanks, Rodrigo. I know, Eric, if you had any uh, comments or questions before we move into this last uh, I, I think we're good. There's a, few, there's a few questions from the audience. Actually, one if we can attack right now is one question from the audience is, to reduce convergence time, can you start on a known coordinate, let's say a survey control point or something along those lines? Uh, yeah, that, well, I can, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, that, okay. That's actually possible. <laughs> <laughs> so you go ahead. <laughs> okay, yes, that, that, that is possible. I mean, it's a, it's a standard, um, sort of uh, least squares problem. So if, if you have uh, uh, known coordinates, you can uh, much more quickly find a converged solution if you know what the solution is. So you can use the, the known position, set up on a known position to uh, quickly uh, get your ambiguities right and then go on from there. So, so theoretically that's done and people have done that kind of work. Um, if the question was, can a particular service do that? Uh, I would have to pass it back to Rodrigo. Well, so this is something that we still uh, um, are to working on for, for as a capability for Atlas, but as soon as you said that, that this is perfectly possible. Uh, this is um, this is a problem of you have a system where, it, as we said before, the, the big constraint on convergence time is resolving the ambiguities in these type of systems. And if you know your position, you can resolve that much, much faster, and then that, that's how, how it works. Okay. Well, thanks, Eric. It's a, it's a good question to lead into, uh, you know, the, what's, ha what's happening now, what we're going to see in the near term and in sort of the longer term beyond the decade. And, and, uh, and, and some of these sort of uh, future trend comments are, are um, I think are very clear, and I guess as we get further in the future, things become a little more uncertain, so there, there are no guarantees. But uh, what we've done here is talk about a few aspects of, of what is happening, what we see happening, and what we believe will happen uh, with these, uh, these global services in, in the next number of years. Uh, the first aspect is accuracy, which uh, everyone's always looking for uh, their, their positional performance. Um, and what Rodrigo is showing, these few centimeter uh, quality uh, solutions in static or kinematic, uh, well, sorry, in kinematic mode, uh, while they, they are uh, extremely good, um, they, they can be improved and, and they, they, they can be improved in a number of different aspects. We've listed some of them here um, in terms of the ionospheric estimation, the tropospheric estimation, the pseudo range and phase multipath and noise, ways to mitigate those and, and the satellite uh, orbits clocks and uh, the other, uh, the other um, 
uh, equipment delays or biases that are that that are involved in these types of complex solutions. Um, so those are where uh, where the error budget can be squeezed and improved. And uh, uh, and what we have on this slide is just a, a few comments on on each of those ma major areas. And um, uh, what we what we are seeing is is small but but noticeable improvements in each of these areas uh, with the honest faric estimation improvements in, in, in the estimation process, uh, improved uh, models to provide a priori information or for single frequency processing, and they are, there are, of course, a, a huge number of single frequency users out there. Um, the introduction of L5 on, on GPS and other constellations, the, these multi-frequency uh, linear combinations to make new effective frequencies uh, that will improve ionospheric estimation. Um, small improvements in the tropospheric est uh, estimation, new models, um, uh, new improvements that, that uh, continue, um, pseudo range phase multipath and noise, which are always difficult, but uh, more hardware improvements from the antenna to the receiver, the correlators in the receiver, and in the processing algorithm. So small improvements still continue, and all the way down to the satellite orbits and clocks, where where um, there are groups that are trying to squeeze the next few millimeters out of each of these, and, and they do improve uh, solutions in time. So we, we do see small improvements in accuracy uh, coming along the way. Uh, of course, a very big question, and it's always asked uh, when we're discussing these topics, is uh, will th these types of global solutions um, uh, work eventually like R2K or network R2K, and and, and the 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 answer to that question lies in the initial convergence period that's required to to estimate the float and then the fixed ambiguities. Can that be taken down from tens of minutes or minutes to to tens of seconds, uh, where which would allow the use in many other applications that have a lot of obstruction, such as uh, construction, the use in urban areas, et cetera, where I think a lot of users may want um, to use these types of global services uh, more frequently. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a wide scope of uh, potential improvements um, to, 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 to bring convergence periods down. Um, multi-frequency, uh, multi-constellation measurements, the more of the brute force approach where uh, we apply more measurements, uh, unique measurements to the estimation process, and that has shown uh, significant improvement. Um, also, uh, related to the convergence, the, the consistency, quality, the integrity, or so-called the robustness of the solution, um, to increase performance that way. Uh, the mitiga mitigation of the noise and multipath that we've talked before, uh, use of other data to aid in initialization, including, um, Eric, the question you asked, where it, if we have a priori information about position as well to help. We've seen a lot of work in robust reconvergence of solutions. Um, and robust ambiguity resolution and validations uh, an issue. So uh, in the next slide, just some comments on each of those. Um, I would just make a, a few, uh, point highlight a few of them. Uh, the main ones being the multi-frequency, multi-constellation uh, availability has, uh, has shown great improvement in convergence, more so than position solutions. So for example, adding GLONASS to a, a GPS solution uh, does not uh, make a great improvement in positioning solution performance, but it, it greatly reduces convergence. However, there is the, uh, the law of diminishing returns that we have to consider, and that's that as we add additional constellations or, or additional measurements, for that matter, uh, they, th after a while, they don't make that much of an improvement. So we add one constellation to one and we see a big improvement, and adding a second, a third, a fourth, or, and so on, we see smaller and smaller improvements. Um, so uh, there, there's one other aspect, and we see that in some of the questions that have been asked. And we can, we can frame it from the sort of consumer market, if we use that term. Uh, how can these, these, um, these global correction services be applied in the in the near term or over the next number of years to um, 
uh, to the consumer market. That is, if we uh, we most of this work considers dual frequency, high quality receivers with high quality antennas. What if we consider uh, low cost? receivers and antennas. Well, right away, as soon as we put in the uh, a low-cost uh, antenna, the quality of the the code and phase um, noise uh, uh, deteriorates, the, the multipath goes up, there can be phase cycle flips, etc., and these uh, make, uh, make a, quite a difficult job for the processing algorithms to handle. So uh, can there be a somewhat graceful transition to lower um, lower uh, quality hardware? Um, can such correction services be uh, used in conjunction with uh, assisted uh, GPS, assisted GNSS uh, solutions, or combined with other technologies such as IMUs and other sensors? Um, there, are, there are a lot of possibilities out there, and there's a few thoughts on this slide of, of, uh, of some of these, uh, some, that some of these um, Possibilities are um, uh, are quite great, and others will be very challenging. For example, uh, making use of low-cost antennas uh, makes it very difficult to to process the data that's resulting from those antennas. Um, so, with that, and given the time, we'd just like to summarize with one final slide uh, before passing things back over to Eric. And um, uh, what we can say, in a nutshell, is that uh, with more signals. Uh, these global services uh, show performance that is getting more and more RTK-like. Um, also, and perhaps almost as important, is that uh, these globally available, very general corrections from these sources are, are being generated uh, um, uh, now in, in a very consistent way to provide few centimeter or centimeter level single user uh, positioning and navigation in a, in a, in a global basis. And one would expect that um, as we uh, move forward with improved technology, lower cost, and multi-sensor systems, that we'll see continued increase in the precision of the overall solutions. So with, with that, I'd, I'd like, uh, like to pass things back to Eric. Uh, thanks, Sunil. So we got some great questions here, and I think one that was actually covered in one of the slides, but maybe we need to emphasize it, and this is for Rodrigo. And the question is, will third-party receivers require firmware enhancements and be able to use Atlas Link? The, well, to use the Atlas Link, no. That, uh, um, if you are talking about what we discussed in terms of uh, the smart link feature where you just uh, plug in Atlas link to an existing receiver. Any uh, RTK capable receiver that supports a standard correction message such as RTCM would work with absolutely no modification. Right, it's so really it's a 15 RTCM minute output from Atlas link. Yeah, so it's really a 15 minute process to get it up and running. Okay, very good. So more or less plug and play, just to uh, output RTCM out of Atlas Link and then plug into your receiver. And virtually all dual frequency receivers these days are RTCM3 compatible. That's correct. So it, it is designed so that the other receiver understands what we what's we transmitting the messages. So. Okay. So um, another question is uh, the the uh, audience asked. You talk a lot about accuracy, but what reference or truth are you using? So I guess the probably the question is which datum uh, is uh, as Atlas referenced to? So it's ITIF 2008, which is uh, a, a very typical, it's kind of a, a high accuracy version of uh, WGS, if you will. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, a industry or, or scientific standard for reference, global reference frames nowadays. So that's what Atlas uses as well. Most of the systems use a similar similar reference system. Right. That's yeah. That's been my experience too. With I think it's the current date epoch too, right? Or within uh, yeah. within a half a year or so. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so we, we talked a bit about uh, Sunil talked a bit about the advantage of multi GNSS and how you have diminishing returns as you add constellations. Uh, one of the audience members is asking about triple frequency. So when you bring if and when you bring L5 into the solution, what is there any advantage there? To uh, for accuracy or convergence time. 
yes, uh, clearly there's a there's a couple of aspects. Uh, if you, we just, for example, consider just GPS L1 and L2 versus L1, L2, and 5, not considering other constellations, but just using the one example of dual to triple frequency, uh, there's a few areas. One is uh, with uh, just various linear combinations of those three uh, frequencies versus two, you have additional data, and that increases your, um, uh, your, your power to, to estimate your solution. So we can see uh, an improvement in initial position estimate uh, so then that reduces the convergence time because the initial estimates are, are more accurate than they were with just dual frequency. Uh, we also can, uh, through a lot of work that many people have already done, trying to find the idealized con uh, combinations for um, hand better handling the ionosphere, better managing it. And so we also see improvement there, significant improvement, since the ionospheric um, refraction is a significant uh, limiter to uh, to, to quick um, estimation of good float ambiguities to get us to fix solutions. Uh, so that, that also helps. And then, um, so, so that, that becomes quite significant to the point that uh, in, in some simulations that have done, uh, some, some researchers uh, report a, a very, very quick um, convergence. Um, uh, down from the tens of minutes and, and, and minutes in, into the you know the tens of seconds range uh, in simulations under idealized conditions. So um, there's great hope for the triple frequency solutions. And I'll add so on top of that that are, um, on top of that uh, some of the new third frequency signals we are seeing like B3 we have uh, uh, we have a better quality of the code measurements uh, that we can make out of those signals that also helps so in addition to all the work that we can do on ionosphere linear combination we sometimes in certain cases we're actually seeing better signals coming up and those also help uh, of uh, convergence and general performance so along those lines, uh, one of the audience members is asking about L2C, and uh, and I guess that's a question I would have too: is are you taking advantage of L2C with Atlas, or do you see yourself, if not, are you see yourself taking advantage of it down the line, and does it really add to the uh, the performance of uh, this uh, service? So the L2C helps in terms of it, it's a signal that uh, you can track the signal more robustly, right? You can you can track L2C in certain situations where you'd otherwise not being able to track L2E. So in terms of uh, having pos more positions available, yes, that would help. Uh, in terms of uh, final accuracy and convergence, uh, I don't think that would uh, make uh, much of a difference as compared to our existing uh, L2P signals that we use for GPS. Okay. And so another question, this is one I had too, and I think it's worthy of some clarification. And one of the audience member asks, uh, what's the difference between SBAS, and I think he's referring to either WAS or EGNOS or MSAS or GAGAN, those type of systems, the single frequency sort of sub-meter systems. What's the difference between that and PPP like the Atlas service for single frequency receivers. So you want to do that one or do that one? I, sure, sure. I could. Uh, I can speak just generally, and if you want to follow up with Atlas specifically. Um, okay. I mean, there there are there are differences between something like WAS and uh, and let's say the PPP algorithms in that. Uh, uh, there are similarities and differences. I mean, for w the similarities are with WASP, there is a, a network, um, or if we're talking Gagan or EGNOS, uh, a regional network that is providing uh, improved orbits and clocks and atmospheric models that are being then applied, uh, transmitted and applied as corrections by the user. However, at the user end, these are typically um, L1 code uh, corrections. There might be some code smoothing, other things that are going on, uh, whereas a PPP solution uh, is more sophisticated. It's making great use of the, the phase measurement and, and the filtering. So the, the, so the WAS-type solutions are, are, are more, more similar to what was referred to as autonomous positioning or, or point positioning 
uh, where what those systems are doing is they're they're not providing necessarily greater accuracy. They tend to, but their real focus is on integrity, providing availability and integrity for safety of life applications, specifically you know civilian aviation. Whereas uh, PPP tends to refer to uh, dual frequency solutions, and they're provided uh, at um, with with much more sophisticated processing algorithms that allow for after convergence the few centimeter type uh, kinematic solutions that uh, that Rodrigo uh, has shown. So so there are uh, one can say that they're for they're they're for different markets in that sense. I don't know, Rodrigo, if you want to follow up. Well, that's fun for me. So I'd like to sort of lead into the conversation about the different levels of service. I think Rodrigo uh, addressed that a little bit earlier, but I'd like to make it clear. So there's, as far as I understand it, and I'll sort of summarize, and, and Rodrigo, maybe you can respond, is so there's the H10 service, which is sort of the, the traditional dual frequency PPP service that gets you down to a few centimeters accuracy with uh, with some convergence time. And so there's an H10 service from Alice, and there's also an H30 service, which is a subfoot solution. And, and I don't know much about that service, and maybe you can expand on it a little bit. Um, and there's the H100 service, which is a submeter service. And, and I guess uh, to expand on the earlier question, the difference between a system like WAS and Atlas on the single frequency level is that WAS is a GPS only system. I don't recall if EGNOS is either it may be dual it might be a uh, GPS GLONASS but certainly WAS is a GPS only service whereas Atlas I believe on the H100 single frequency service for submeter accuracy is a GPS uh, and GLONASS service and so and where that can become important is not necessarily in open environments like in agriculture and such but we start working in environments where under tree canopy and in difficult environments where you need extra satellites, for example, GLONASS, and you can get direct corrections from ATLAS for both GPS and GLONASS, there can be a, a distinct advantage there. And I'll, I'll pass it on to you, Rodrigo, for your comments. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's it's both the, the matter of having multi-constellation support and also the geographic availability, right? Because then there are, there are regions of the world that uh, you have absolutely no access to SBAS systems. Uh, and yet, those uh, regions they still have applications who could that could benefit from those type of uh, uh, levels of accuracy. Uh, so, coming down to the H30, it's basically the same thing about how you make or compromises uh, in terms of uh, cost and accuracy. So, certain people don't need as much accuracy, and they would be willing to buy a service that's not as accurate but at a lower cost and that's where the, the different levels of a service come from uh, to have uh, H10 which is basically the ultimate accuracy that you can get of a global system today um, and then have a 30 which is a compromise we still need some kind of a subfoot accuracy made for MGIS application and, and our agri agriculture application but they don't need a centimeter and then have H100 that that uh, uh, basically covers typical user cases where you are, we would be happy with access to a multi GNSS SBAS type of system, type of performance. Okay, thanks for that. So another really good question from the audience is uh, they ask about the applicability of Atlas in dynamic applications, for example, uh, moving vehicles. Uh, and so they're asking, can the solution reconverge if if uh, GPS or GNSS is temporarily lost in a dynamic environment, and I assume that the, the audience members speaking of you know passing under a bridge or that kind of scenario. But I think in general, talking about the dynamic nature, you know, because people may be thinking this is only for a static solution, but you know, I think we need to talk about using it on tractors and and other uh, dynamic uh, applications. Uh, so can you speak to the performance in that kind of environment, Rodrigo? No. Absolutely. So, um, when when you look at uh, how the data is processed, uh, the, how how things are implemented in the GNSS processing side of things, there are no assumptions about the receiver not moving. So, all the assumptions that are made when we computer position are made, we're assuming that the receiver is moving all the time, um, and therefore, they basically 
besides uh, changes in environment, if you're uh, under a tree or going on a tree or in the open, uh, if you're moving or not makes no difference. As a matter of fact, hemisphere receivers, they are, they are able to operate at a very high dynamic environment. We have uh, seen that in the past. So this is something that uh, uh, we, we support uh, uh, in general. Okay, and then another question is, uh, uh, and actually it's from several people, and we've sort of addressed it during the, the webinar here, but maybe we can touch on it again, is a lot of people are asking, hey, is worldwide PPP, uh, does it have the potential to replace local RTK networks in the future and offer global coverage? And I, I know we've touched on it a bit in the, in the earlier part of the webinar, but I think it's, it's such a key point. We ought to have a short discussion here about it too. Maybe, Sunil, you can start on that. Yeah, maybe I, um, as the academic, I could be a little more free with my words than Rodrigo. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but that's that, uh, you know, we never want to say never. Um, but at the same time, we've seen this uh, uh, fairly steady progress, as we described in the in the webinar, uh, steady progress in improved performance and, and reduced convergence period uh, in these, these global solutions. And... Uh, and we've also seen uh, when uh, when we add uh, we've added constellations, and we've taken into account the issues between constellations, whether they're uh, spatial datum or temporal datum differences, um, uh, inner frequency, inner channel, inner constellation biases. There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to to properly integrate um, different constellations. But when when we do, and the measurements then become sort of generic additional measurements to the solution, uh, the, the, one needs to understand that these solutions are, are measurement driven. So the quality and the quantity and the availability of the measurements really absolutely drives the quality of the solution. So uh, we, 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 are, we are improving improving those solutions and, uh, and I could stick my neck out and say that um, yes, I think we will see near RTK like performance with these uh, these global services. I mean that's the that that's the sort of the holy grail, the the goal. And um, as we've seen in, in you know simulations, other things, we see uh, some quite good performance. Uh, it won't be tomorrow. Uh, it'll be uh, you know maybe a number of years away still, but we are seeing uh, a significant improvements. Now that does not necessarily mean that we'll see the the, the disappearance of uh, RTK networks and other things like that. I mean, uh, the, the, the systems do work differently and they perform differently under different conditions. So I'd have to include that caveat, but we're, we're, we're making great strides. Rodrigo, would you like to comment? <laughs> So yeah, no, but um, I'm, I don't disagree at all from Sunil Um Like I believe also that uh, that's the way we're going. That's uh, that's where we are going to eventually get. Uh, there are a major number of people in the GNSS community, both scientific and industry, working towards that, uh, and that's where we want to be. Um, I think uh, there will be different aspects on how we're going to get there. We uh, Parts of uh, improvement will be uh, on the uh, constellation. We are going to have more satellites and more uh, uh, frequencies. We're going to have more data and better data that will help us to improve and, and start to get move in that direction. We're going to have uh, more uh, uh, things going on in the infrastructure also that will help and also in algorithms. Uh, so how well we understand uh, uh, the Earth and atmosphere and how well we can uh, model those effects also play a role uh, as well. So when we put all th three together, the progressing over time uh, and a number of people working on those, then th we are going to s move towards that direction as we move on. And I believe, I really believe that eventually we're going to get there. Now, I think over the next two years, what we're going to see is uh, uh, people will come up with a very interesting concepts on how to make compromises across those three areas of improvement in terms of uh, giving you a little bit of an edge in terms of performance in certain situations, either if, uh, of a more infrastructure even, or if more uh, innovative ideas or with more uh, 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 signals and, and satellites. So um, I think that will be a long transition phase and a very interesting one where we're going to see a lot of uh, interesting 
concepts coming up over the next years uh, in both scientific and uh, industry, scientific community and industry, and uh, that's what I believe that we're going to be seeing over the next year or so, and eventually I believe you're going to get there, yes. Yeah, and, and just a thought from, from my perspective is that it seems like you could also come up with a sort of hybrid RTK PPP solution if you had a more dense network of reference stations that you could access within certain regions, right? Then you could sort of uh, enhance your PPP solution and sort of get a hybrid or even near RTK solution. Is that correct? Absolutely. Well, very good. Well, we've gone 10 minutes over since it's been a, such a lively conversation here and lots of audience interaction. There's still lots of questions left, but uh, we've sort of reached our limit here. So um, the contact info is on the uh, is on the slide right now for myself, Rodrigo, and Sunil. And uh, it's a great conversation, guys. I really appreciate it. And uh, Bethany, it's uh, back to you now. Thanks, Eric. And thank you to our audience for attending today's webinar. If you have any more questions, do not hesitate to contact our presenters at the emails on your screen now. Links to their email addresses are also in the bios at the left. An on-demand recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon and will be available online for a full year at gpsworld.com slash webinars. If you'd like to share this webinar with your colleagues, you can do so via any of the links on the left-hand side of your screen. You can also download today's slides by clicking on the green folder icon at the far right of your dock. If you are already a GPS World Magazine subscriber, we'd like to invite you to sign up today for free. All you have to do is click on the GPS logo at the far left of your dock and fill out a short form. Our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, August 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Registration will be opening soon, so check back at gpsworld.com webinars. We look forward to seeing you at a future webinar.